Hello everyone, and welcome to Stats250 Lab. This week we're going to be talking about all things linear regression. Um, so a couple of reminders before we get started. Um, so remember to always check Canvas for your official due dates and times. So we need to, um, each week remember, we need to complete the lab wrap-up quiz. So this week, labs 11 and 12, complete that wrap-up quiz once we finish the lab. Um, make sure you also complete your next homework, homework 9. And we also need to complete the pre-labs. We have two more to go. So if you end up watching this video before Monday, April 6th, make sure that you turn in that pre-lab 11. Or if you're watching this after, hopefully you already did turn that in. And then after that, we only have one more pre-lab left, pre-lab 12, which is more of a creative reflection. That won't be due until April 17th, as of this video recording. Um, and if you have any additional help for going over linear regression, um, one source to check out would be supplement 2 in your lab workbook. So this is in pages 7 through 10. Um, so this goes over a full regression analysis type problem and it also goes over interpretations. So this is a very helpful walkthrough to kind of work more at your speed. Um, so that's that'll be really helpful in going over top topics this week. Um, so we'll start off with just a tiny bit of review just to see where regression fits within the class of what we've been talking about so far. Um, so, you, knew, you realize that we've been talking about all these different types of hypothesis tests. Um, so, before we were talking about categorical data, working with our proportion type test, going over one population or two population. And then we also talked about quantitative data with our mean type analysis, our one mean, paired means, two means, or ANOVA we talked about a little bit as well. So, you notice in each of these cases, we always had varied numbers of populations, but we were always only working with one particular variable, whether it be categorical or quantitative. But with regression, it kind of flips. So in this case, we're only looking at one population. So instead of looking at differences between populations, what we are instead interested in is seeing relationships between variables within one population. Um, but other than that, um, going over regression is more helpful in just working through one of our problems. So we'll go ahead and get started with the review by example for our lab 11. Um, so lab 11 first, going over more exploratory analysis for linear regression. Um, so that'll be on page 85 in your lab workbook. So we have a random sample of 14 sales staff for a very large company. We're given a creativity test with scores ranging from 0 to 20 points, and we're evaluated on sales growth performance. Um, so we are asked to explore and model the relationship between these two variables with the goal of using the creativity score to predict sales growth performance. So just in general, we need to remember that regression studies the relationship between two quantitative variables. So these two variables, we can call the first one a response variable, which is also called our dependent y. Um, so we say that this measures the outcome of the study. And then our second variable is the explanatory variable, which can also be called our independent x. And this is th thought to explain the changes in our response variable. So that's how this relationship works, is one is affecting the other. So now that we know a bit of information on this, um, we can answer our first question. So we have, in this regression analysis, the variable creativity score plays the role of what type of variable? So think about it for a second. So we would say that the our creativity score would be our explanatory variable. Looking back in our information of our problem, we could see that our goal of this study is to use creativity score to predict sales growth performance. So we're using creativity score to explain the shift in sales growth. Um, so if we'll look at our next question. We have, from the scatter plot, we observe a moderately strong linear relationship. What are the other two observations that should be made from this plot in this initial stage? Um, so looking back at this scatter plot, um, so with our particular graphs, if we look back at from the beginning of the semester when we first started talking about describing graphs, when we talked about histograms, remember we had four certain aspects we would need to touch on within those descriptions. And it's pretty similar with scatter plots. We also have four aspects to comment on, but these four aspects are, the first one was a form, which in our case, we just have to say if it's linear or not. Then we can also mention the direction, 
which we could say if it's positive or negative, positive meaning we kind of see this upward trend versus the downward trend would be more negative. We can also comment on the strength to see if it's weak, moderate, or strong. Um, a strong relationship, we would see our particular points in our scatter plot kind of forming like a particular line. And so like our, all of our points seem to be following that certain line. That'd be a very strong relationship between everything. But then if we notice within our scatter plot our points not really following a line, there's still kind of that um, trend of either upward or downward linear trend, but the points themselves aren't like exactly following a line. Um, that could kind of show our strength not being as strong. So we can comment on the strength as well as the last thing, we could comment on outliers. So if there are any particular points that seem to be far away from the rest. We could say that those might be any apparent outliers. Um, so looking back at our prompt for this question, we have a moderately strong linear relationship. So we, straight, so we see that we already have two out of these four aspects, our form given as linear and our strength moderately strong. So our other two observations we have to talk about are direction and if there are any outliers. So first, let's talk about the direction. So looking at our particular scatter plot, we can kind of see this positive association between these two variables. We see our creativity score as that goes up. We could see that our sales growth performance, all these particular points seem to be following that upward trend. So we can see this positive association. association. So I'm going to look at our last point, our outliers. So looking at the scatter plot, it doesn't seem that any of the points are like any farther away than the rest. So we can say if there aren't any apparent outliers. Looking at our next question, we have one employee in the study scored 16 points in the creativity test and had a sales growth performance score of 100 points. What is the value of the residual for this employee? So in finding the residual, this is kind of a three-step process that we need to follow. So first, let's figure out what a residual actual is. The residual is the difference between what is actually observed and what our regression equation actually predicts. So in finding what this residual is, first we have to find what our regression equation is, and we can use that regression equation to plot a particular line within our scatter plot to be able to make predictions. So once we find that regression equation, we can use it to predict a certain response. And then once we have that prediction, we want to find the difference from that prediction to our actual observation at our particular point. And this difference between our prediction and our actual observation will be our residual that we're trying to find. Um, so more when we find that regression equation, what that's actually plotting is what's called a least squares regression line. So the definition of this, we say that it's a line that minimizes the sum of squares of these observed errors. So if you notice within the scatter plot, you notice all of our particular points and their distances to this least squares regression line. What this line is trying to do is like minimize all these distances. So it's finding this line of best fit for this relationship, basically. Um, so when we need to find this, we don't actually need to like find this by hand in any mathematical way. We'll just use our R and output to find what this equation is. So in, in setting up this re equation, um, you might be familiar with what's from our mathematical notation. So the slope intercept form equation, y equals mx plus b, where the m is our slope and the b is our y intercept. So this equation is pretty similar in, our, in statistics. It just uses different notation in statistics. So we have two different versions of this formula. One if we're talking about our population data and one for our sample. Um, usually with us, we're usually concerned, since we usually don't have that population data readily on hand, we usually are given our sample data, and we'll go ahead and use the sample version of this equation. So this y hat equals v0 plus v1x, where this y hat is this predicted response. And what we're trying to um, fill in are our coefficients. So this v sub 0 is like our y-intercept, and this v sub 1 is our slope. And we need to use our, our output to fill in these coefficients to make this line. So in finding these coefficients, we'll just, um, as I said, go look at our, our output. 
And we can look at under coefficients, the first column gives us the, uh, these estimates for these coefficients. The first one in the first row within this column of estimates will be the y-intercept, as you see that first row labeled namely intercept. So that'll be our y-intercept estimate, our b sub zero, and then the one right underneath that, so the estimate for our particular explanatory variable, that'll be the slope estimate for our sample data, or b sub one. So that'll be how we find both these coefficients that we can plug into our regression equation. Um, so before we move on, since we're talking about the slope, I might as well talk about um, our interpretation for our slope coefficient. Um, so with our slope, what we're concerned with is how much do we expect our response variable to change on average for every one unit increase in our explanatory variable. So we can go ahead and kind of put this more in context, answer this question with our particular slope that we just found. So with the slope, um, we could write something like, for every additional point earned on the creativity test, so every point in our explanatory, um, we expect our response, so we expect sales growth performance to increase by our slope of 1.7152 points on average. So this is helpful to know, as we know interpretations are pretty important for us, so this is just helpful for us moving forward. Um, so now that we actually have these coefficients, we can plug them into our regression equation. So again, those coefficients of 78.8 and 1.7152, plug those in respectively, and that'll get us our equation for our least squared line. Now that we have this particular equation for our first step, we can move on to the second step, which is predicting our response. So when we predict our response, we'll take that equation we just made, we will plug in our explanatory variable of interest. In this case, we're interested in a creativity score of 16 points. So we'll plug in 16 for X to get our predicted Y response, our predicted sales growth performance of 106.2893 points. All right, so this 106.2893, that is our predicted sales growth performance. So now that we have this prediction and we also were given our actual observation of 100, now we have to find the difference between these to get our residual. So that'll be our third step, calculating this. So calculating our residual, we always want to do it in this way. So our, our E is our variable for residual. We always want to do it in the way where we're doing our actual observation minus our predicted observation. And we always do it in this way so we could also see how they compare in terms of if our actual observation was above or below our prediction. So we see here that our actual observation was 6.2893 points below our predicted response. So that's why our residual is negative 6.2893. All right, so those were, that was a little bit of a process of finding this residual. Now we can look at our next point, um, which is looking at our two important measures for strength for our simple linear equation, which these two um, measures are given as r and r squared. So the first one is r, which we call our cor correlation coefficient. So we say that this correlation ranges from negative one to positive one. So as you um, looking first at the sign of r, this is what indicates the direction of our relationship, if it's negative or positive. And then the magnitude indicates the, the strength of the relationship, basically. So if the coefficient were closer to a one, then that would mean that it would be a pretty strong relationship versus if it were closer to zero, that'd be a pretty weak relationship. So that's a little bit about our correlation coefficient. Now we can talk about r squared, which is our coefficient of determination. Um, since this is a squared number, basically just squaring the correlation to get that determination coefficient. So since it's, it's a squared number, it only ranges from 0 to 1, so it's a positive number. Um, and with our determination, we could look at its interpretation. So it's another interpretation that's helpful for us to look at. So we say that it's the percent of variation in the response variable that can be explained specifically by its linear relationship with the explanatory variable. 
So now knowing this, we can go ahead and look at our next question. So complete this sentence. Based on the analysis, blank percent of the variability in sales growth performance is accounted for by its linear relationship with creativity score. So think about it for a second. So this is basically an interpretation of R squared that we just went over, right? So how do we find R squared? Again, it's as simple as looking at our output provided, our regression analysis output. So after our coefficients, um, we can see within this output we have some R squareds. Um, one says multiple R squared, one is adjusted R squared. We don't need to worry about looking at adjusted R squared at all. We only need to look at the multiple R squared. That's the one that we're focused on. So given this output of multiple R squared of 0 0.5406, so we can go ahead and plug that into our interpretation. 54.06% of our variability in our response is accounted for by its linear relationship with our explanatory variable. Awesome. So now let's take a look at the last question. So we have, if an employee scored just one point on the creativity test, our least squared regression line would predict the sales growth performance to be 80.56. What caution should we be weary of for this prediction? So whenever we're running our regression tests, there are a couple cautions we should be wary about. One of them is called extrapolation, which is when we are predicting outside of our x value bounds. So whenever we're working with a certain sample, whenever we're looking at our explanatory variable, whatever um, is the range of those um, within that variable, we should only be predicting within the range that's provided that we created our regression with. Um, and then our second caution is correlation does not imply causation, which is something that we've all probably had heard before. All right. So looking at this, um, if we look closely at our explanatory variable, our creativity score, we see that that ranges from 7 to 18 points. So from this, we should be cautious on making predictions outside of this. So trying to um, predict with a creativity score of 1. So since that's not included within the sample that we use to make this regression equation, um, then it would probably not be such a good equation to try to predict with our creativity score of 1, since it's not included within that sample, basically. So again, that's an example of our extrapolation. So we should be weary of the data that we used and what any more data that we tried to predict it with. All right. All right, so we can go ahead and get started with the ILP for Lab 11. Um, so what we'll do is we'll actually work through the first part of this ILP together, and then I'll leave the second part for you guys to do on your own. So the goal for this ILP, we want to use the data set um, given as stats250data.r data to examine the relationship among final exam score and various other explanatory variables. So make sure that when you are downloading your data set through, from Canvas, make sure it is specifically this one, stats250data.r data, because I know there are a couple others that might start with stats250-something, stats250-something else. Make sure that it's stats250-data is the one that you're using. So we want to determine which variable predicts final exam scores best. So we'll use the explanatory variables, average homework, exam 1, or exam 2. So in doing this, we will examine scatter plots and correlations to ensure that a linear relationship is appropriate and determine which model is strongest. So the first thing that you want to do is load in the data set once you have it downloaded and uploaded to R Commander. Um, after that, what you want to do is form your scatter plots for each of these explanatory variables in conjunction with our response variable of our final exam. So we'll go ahead and take a look at our first scatter plot, which is with our response variable final exam with our first possible explanatory variable average homework. Once you make the scatter plot, again, we have our four aspects that we can describe the scatter plot with. So the first one is the form. We can see that it, it is indeed linear. We're not seeing any other patterns with it. So it's pretty linear. Um, our direction is positive. We can see this upward fashion happening with the points. The strength. Um, so again, remembering like the strongest plots would pr probably look more like a straight line versus a weaker relationship would kind of take less form of that line. So since this 
it's not exactly a line, it's actually pretty blobby. So we might say that this uh, relationship, although it is linear and positive, it might be pretty weak. Um, and then in terms of our outliers, we can see that there are some points towards the bottom that seem to be a little farther away than the rest. So we can say that these ones are potential outliers. Um, next, we can look at our scatter plot with our second explanatory variable possibility, so final exam versus exam one scores. Again, after you see the scatter plot, we can comment on the form, which again is linear. The direction again is positive. The strength, we could see that this one kind of looks a little bit more like a line than the last one did. Um, so this one is a little bit stronger, so we could say the strength is a little more moderate in this case. And then looking at outliers, we can see if there's one in particular that kind of seems a little farther than, than the rest. So we can say that this one in particular is a potential outlier in that upper left. And then we can take a look at our last scatter plot, our final exam versus our exam two. Um, so actually looking at those last two, how we did them, I'm going to kind of leave this one to you before we go over it together. So feel free to pause the video, kind of think about how we would describe our four aspects, and then we'll go ahead and meet up in the next couple seconds. All right, so for our form in this case, we could say again that we're looking at this linear relationship, and again, our direction is positive. Um, for this one, our strength um, seems even stronger. The points seem even more and more kind of in that shape of the line. So this one, we could say our strength is like, we could still say it could be moderate to strong because it's a pretty stronger relationship than our previous two in terms of our strength. And then our outliers, in this case, we're not really seeing any particular points that seem to be really far away than the rest of them in this case. So we could say if there aren't any apparent outliers. All right. So now looking at our next question. So based on the scatter plots and these particular correlation values, which variable will we use to predict final exam scores? So we can go ahead and plot this correlation matrix that we have in our commander, and we can get all of these um, correlation coefficients that we can compare our final exam to our certain explanatory variables. And in this case, we can go ahead and look at our column for our final exam score, and we can see which explanatory variable seems to be the most correlated. So in this case, we can see that exams two has the strongest relationship with our final exam as it has that um, higher co coefficient as compared to average homework in exam one. All right, so now that we know that we want to use exam two as our explanatory variable for our final exam, you guys can go ahead and complete part two in the ILP on your own. So the goal for the second part is to fit a, liter a linear model to our data. So again, using exam two scores to predict final exam scores. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of the solutions for the trickier problems within the second part. Um, so interpret the estimated slope, so our B sub one, in terms of the change in your explanatory variable. So we should have found our particular slope to be 0 0.7992. So how do we interpret this slope in context? We could say for every additional point earned on exam two, our exam two is our explanatory, uh, we would expect our response, we would expect the final exam score to increase by our slope by 0 0.7992 points on average. So we are applying that interpretation of our slope within this context. We could also um, look at this question. So report our coefficient of determination and interpret its value. So our other interpretation. Um, so our R squared, if we looked at our output, um, it would be provided to be 0 0.5956. So now that we have that, we can go ahead and make this interpretation. So we can say about 60% or about 59.56% of the variation in final exam score is explained by the linear relationship with exam two score. So again, applying that general interpretation within our context of exam scores.
All right, so now we can go ahead and get started with the second part of this lab. Um, so instead of going over some exploratory analysis, now we can go over more inference type problems. So this will be um, going over our lab 12. So we'll start off again with the review by example for lab 12, which will be found on page 91. We'll go over the prompt. So we have in 1905, R.J. Gladstone conducted a study of the relations of the brain to the size of the head. Brain weight in grams and head size in cubic centimeters per measurements were performed for 237 adults, and the results are summarized within your workbook. So for our first question, we have, based on the model, predict brain weight for a person whose head size is 3,500 centimeters cubed. So remember, in terms of making our predicted brain weight, predicting our response variable, we need to create our regression equation, and then we can go ahead and use that to make these predictions. So for us, we'll go ahead and first form that regression equation using our estimates we find within our regression analysis. So again, looking at this output, we have our y-intercept estimate and our slope estimate given within this first column of the coefficients. Um, so the first one um, within this column is our y-intercept, and the second one is our slope estimate. So we can go ahead and apply these within our regression equation. Remember, in, term, in terms of our sample, our y hat equals b0 plus b1x. So our b0 y-intercept of 327.16. Plug in our b sub 1 of 0 0.26. And then we can also plug in our x. Um, our, so that would be our head size of 3,500, as we're using that as our explanatory variable. And then we can go ahead and, after plugging in all these numbers and solving this equation, we'll get us our predicted brain weight of 1,237.16 grams. All right, so now we're looking at our next question. We have use a 1% significance level to assess if there is a significant positive linear relationship between the brain weight and head size for all adults in 1905. Um, so again, this kind of sounds like that we're working with a hypothesis type test. So the first um, step within our test is to state the hypotheses to be tested. So in terms of a linear regression type hypothesis test, um, we have our three possible options for our statements. The first one is our um, beta, beta sub 1 is equal to 0 versus our alternative of beta sub 1 would be greater than 0. So remember, whenever we have a slope greater than 0, that indicates a positive relationship. If our slope is less than 0, that indicates a negative relationship. Um, and also remember, in this case, our um, beta sub 1 represents our population slope. Sorry, probably should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> so um, when looking at our population slope of beta sub 1, um, we could kind of look at whatever hypotheses that we would need. So looking back at our problem, we were looking for particularly a positive linear relationship between brain weight and head size. So in this case, that means that we would want to set our hypotheses. So again, our null hypothesis, our beta sub 1 equals 0, indicating our null assumption that there is no relationship. And then our alternative hypothesis, what we're actually trying to test for, that positive linear relationship. So we want to see our slope beta sub 1 greater than 0. We can also go ahead and define our parameter. So our parameter is our population slope beta sub 1 represents that population average change in brain weight for each additional cubic centimeter in head size. And again, this is for all adults in 1905 represented by this sample. Um, so for our next question within this review by example, we have consider the residual versus fitted plot provided. Which assumptions could be verified using this plot? So before we look at, into this, we want to look to see what all assumptions we have for our regression type hypothesis test. So our stated technical assumptions required for inference, we have um, each of these three. The first one is our population relationship is in fact linear. And then our other two assumptions have to do with our true errors. So the true errors are normally distributed and the true errors have constant variance. So again, when we talk about the true errors, remember whenever we state our assumptions, we're stating them in terms of our population. So our population of error terms we call the true errors. But then when we check these assumptions, remember we usually check them 
since we don't have our population data, we use them with our sample data. So our sample of our errors, we will call the residuals. So looking closely at this residual versus fitted plot, we'd say that this is used to check for two of our assumptions that um, the population relationship is in fact linear and the true errors have constant variance. So in terms of checking with this plot, what we wanna see is this random scatter of observations and we also wanna see if that's centered around this band of zero as we see within this y axis of our residuals centered around that zero. And we also wanna see a fairly constant width. So basically this random scatter as we're seeing within this plot is kind of showing these two assumptions to be true. And also a quick note about the relationship being in fact linear. Remember since we were kind of before we were kind of looking for that linear relationship with our original scatter plot, we could also still use that to check for that particular assumption as well. Um, so we have our residual versus fitted plot checking for these two assumptions. So our last assumption for normal distribution of our error rates. Again, we would want to use, since it's talking about a normal distribution, we could use our QQ plots to check for that normal distribution. But remember, in this case, we want to plot our residual terms, our standardized residuals. And we want to see these residuals following that straight upward slope positive line. And then in that case, we could say that this does have a normal distribution, these error rates. All right, so looking back at our particular problem, we were considering particularly the residuals versus fitted plot. So we would say that this is used to check two of the three assumptions, those two assumptions being that the population relationship is linear and the true errors have constant variance. Now I can look at the next question, state the observed value of the test statistic, the corresponding p-value, and our decision for the test. So for this, how do we look for our test statistic and corresponding p-value? Again, it's just as simple as looking at our regression output. So within this output, you see um, the first column that we were interested in before provided our estimates. If we look further down to the third column, that gives us our particular um, t values. So that'll be our test statistic. And then in the next column, that will give us our probability associated with that t value. So that will be the p value of our test statistic. So whenever we're looking for the, the test statistic and the p-value, we always want to look in this column in relationship with our explanatory variable. So that would be the second one in this case, the, the second row, which corresponds to our explanatory variable of head size, will give us our correct t statistic and p-value. So looking at this, we see this t-value of 20.08. So we can see that our test statistic will be that t of 20.08. Now that we found the test statistic, we can go ahead and, and find its corresponding p-value. So one thing to note within the regression analysis is that the p-value provided is always for a two-sided type test. So whenever we do a one-sided test for our population slope, our relationship, what we, we want to do with the p-value is just divide that by two, and that'll give us our p-value for just that one particular side. So now, now that we have this p-value, um, so our p-value provided, divide that by two, that gets us um, one e minus 16. So basically what this is saying is our p-value is extremely small. And remember that whenever we make our decisions, what we wanna see is our p-value being less than or equal to our significance level. Since we had our significance level of 1%, we see this p-value is definitely smaller than that. So we, that'll lead us to our decision to reject our null hypothesis. All right. So now we have, um, we observed our t test statistic of 20.08. What is the distribution of the test statistic if the null hypothesis is true? So remember these types of questions. So what is our distribution if the null is true? This is just, all this is asking for is our particular test statistic, our t value, what, what distribution how do we describe it? So remember, whenever we find our test statistic, our t values, um, that'll be found in our t distribution. So our 
T distribution label, remember we just have our one parameter, our degrees of freedom. So in this case, we would take our sample size minus two gets us our distribution label, our T distribution, 234 degrees of freedom. So before we move on to the last question, I just want to talk about um, these different types of intervals that we can see. So we have um, for our linear regression, we can create multiple intervals. Two of these include our prediction interval for our individual response, as well as our confidence interval for a population mean response. So there are two important relationships for these particular intervals that we have of interest. So in terms of our prediction and confidence intervals, our prediction intervals are always wider than the confidence intervals. Um, and the reason for that is because our prediction intervals is kind of looking more at a particular individual point and creating an interval from that. Whereas our confidence interval is taking the whole the mean from our whole sample and making a an interval from that from the mean of that sample. So since our, our prediction interval is only looking at one particular point versus the confidence interval is indirectly taking all of the points into account, that's kind of the reason why our confidence intervals should be a little more narrow, whereas it should be a little more precise. And then we also have a point that both intervals will be narrowest at the mean of the explanatory variable. So again, this is narrowest around our x bar. Um, so this will make a little more sense looking at this particular visualization we have provided. So we have um, our particular our confidence interval, which is shown as these um, solid bands. And then our prediction interval is shown by these dotted bands that surround that. So we kind of see at this particular point, we see how the prediction interval is always wider in all the cases. And then also, as we notice in the middle of this graph where we see our sample mean or X bar, we see um, in both cases, those confidence bands getting narrowest towards that mean. So we see these two points kind of being illustrated in this sense. Um, so now knowing a little bit more about those types of intervals, we can look at our last question. So we have suppose both a 99% prediction interval for a single adult 1905 whose head size 3,500 centimeters cubed and a 95% confidence interval, again, for an average brain weight for all adults in 1905 with head size of 3,500 centimeters cubed are constructed. Which of the two intervals will be narrower? So again, in this case, um, remember, we're looking at our prediction and our confidence interval. Remember, our prediction interval is always wider. So which of the two intervals will be narrower? That should be our confidence interval. All right. And just a little bit more, um, when, as we were thinking about our different types of intervals, at what head size in centimeters cubed will the 99% confidence interval be the narrowest? So this is kind of looking more at our latter point within these intervals, saying that these intervals are always narrowest at our sample mean. So if we create our confidence interval for our head size, um, the interval will end up being narrowest at that particular sample mean. So if we look at our head size, its sample mean was 3,630 centimeters cubed. So that'll be where its particular confidence interval should be narrowest. At that, at that sample mean. Okay, so before we move on, um, we have a little note about our R squared, our coefficient of determination. So before when we were saying our coefficient of deter determination, we could find it within our regression analysis output. Um, there is another way that we could find this coefficient of determination though. So this R squared, we could actually find um, by using our ANOVA table specifically looking at the column for our sum of squares. Um, so the R squared is given by this formula, which is our sum of squares for our particular regression over our total sum of squares. So in this case, oh, so we see within our NOVA table, we usually have um, two particular rows of interest. The first one is the our regression model for our explanatory variable. And then the second row is for our error rates. So for our, our numerator in this case, our sum squared for the regression model, we'll take a look at the first row for those sum of squares. In that case, it was 
2,123,910. And then I want to divide that by the total sum of squares, which that just means we have to add up the, the two sum squares that we have provided with the regression model and the residuals. So the 2,123,910, we'll just add that to the residual sum squares, the 1,232,470. That will give us the total, our denominator, and then we'll divide those two numbers to get our r squared to be 0 0.6328. So this is just another way um, for us to find r squared if we don't have that output, that regression analysis output provided to us. We could also use the ANOVA table for that. All right, so we can go ahead and take a look at the IOP for Lab 12. Um, we'll go ahead and work on part two together. So what this ILP is, is kind of going over a full-on hypothesis test for our relationship between our two variables. And part two specifically is looking at that second step of checking our assumptions. So for part two, the goal to create the diagnostic plots for the regression and check these assumptions are met. So we'll work through that together. So looking at part two, it should give you some directions as to uploading our data and working on how to create those plots. It should give you clear-cut directions as to make, as to how to make those plots. So once you go ahead and get those plots created, we can go ahead and move on to the next questions. So first work on those plots, and we'll go ahead and answer those questions after that. All right, now that you have those plots created, we can go ahead and look at our questions. So what assumptions does for our first plot, what assumptions does this plot help assess, and are these assumptions reasonably met? So looking at particularly our residuals versus fitted plots, remember that we have the two assumptions that this checks, that the true errors have constant variance, and our population relationship is indeed linear. So in this case, we could say that these two assumptions are reasonably met because we have that random scatter of observations and this band seems to pretty closely follow along that zero within the y-axis of residuals. And again, we have that fairly constant width. So because all these three, all of these things check out, we could say that these two assumptions are met. So now looking at our ladder plot for that um, PP plot, what assumption does this plot help assess and does it seem to be met? So we have our last assumption that these true errors are normally distributed, so I'll go ahead and use that PP plot for that. And we would say that yes, these assumptions are reasonably met because that residuals follow that approximately that straight line with that positive slope. We see these residual points kind of following that straight positive slope, that dotted line provided. So that would be a good indication of that assumption being met. All right, so now that we have part two done, you can go ahead and keep working through part one, the rest of that hypothesis test on your own. So remember for this, the goal um, is to assess if exam two score is a significant linear predictor for final exam score. So we are still using the same data as we did in lab 11 that we just did, that stats 250 data dot our data. And again, we're still looking at exam two score being our explanatory variable. So you guys can go ahead and get started on that, and once you're done, we'll go over a few select solutions. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so what is your conclusion within context of the problem? So for this, we could go ahead and say something like, we have sufficient evidence to suggest that there is a significant linear relationship between exam two score and final exam score for the population of sets of 50 students represented within this sample. So again, remember that we write our conclusions within terms of our alternative hypothesis. So we have sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative is true. In this case, our, our alternative was if there was any type of relationship between these two variables. Then we can also see a provided interpretation of our resulting interval within context. So this is an interpretation of our interval. So we're looking at one specific interval. So we could say something like, we estimate with 95% confidence that our parameter, in this case, our parameter is our true population slope 
for the linear relationship between these two variables of exam two score and final exam score that that lies within the interval of 0 0.6081 and 0 0.9903. All right, so now that you made it to this point, you might have seen this is kind of a lot of information that we're throwing at you all at once. So as you see that there's a lot of different components to this linear regression. So we kind of made um, the last few slides just to be kind of a summary, like a high level summary of everything we just went over. Um, so remember, we can always check out a supplement two as well in your lab workbook for additional help with it, linear regression. Again, this is pretty helpful, pretty in-depth looking at all the points of our regression analysis. So we'll go ahead and get started with this little summary. So remember um, our first exploratory analysis of our regression, we can make our scatter plot of our two variables and we can describe it with our four aspects, those aspects being our form, direction, strength, and outlier. And we also have our measures of strength within our, within our between these two variables. So those measures of strength being that correlation coefficient as well as that coefficient of determination which our variables provided as r and r squared. So our regression equation for our particular sample, we could say is provided by this y hat equals uh, b0 plus b1x. Remember that b sub 0 is our intercept coefficient, and our b sub 1 is that slope coefficient. Our, whenever we look for any residuals, we always want to find that residual in the order of our actual y and we will subtract from that our prediction, our predicted y. We always want to do it in this particular order, because remember, that will also show us the direction our prediction is away from the actual observation. And we also have a couple interpretations. Um, our first one, our slope. In general, we say that it is our expected average change in our y variable for every one unit increase in x. And our r squared is um, the percent variation in our y variable that can be explained by the linear by specifically the linear relationship with our x variable. So we also worked a lot with this um, r output for regression analysis. So remembering for our explanatory or exploratory analysis, we're usually looking at our estimates or estimate column we'd find that b sub 0, b sub 1 right there. And then finding our r squared, we could look right underneath that to get us that multiple r squared. Remember, we don't need to look at adjusted r squared at all. Don't pay attention to that. Um, for the sake of this class, we're only interested in that multiple r squared is what we're finding. Now we worked a lot bit a bit with that um, regression inference as well. so. Whenever we were looking for that hypothesis test for our certain relationship between our two variables, so we could form our hypotheses, our null hypothesis would be that there is no relationship, and if there's no relationship, our slope should equal zero, so beta sub one equals zero. And then our alternative hypothesis, what we're actually testing for, if it is, if there is a relationship between the two variables, which would mean that our beta sub one is not equal to zero or if we we're more interested in any particular order from a way, any particular positive or negative, we could say that could be greater than or less than as well. And then we can look at the second step of that hypothesis test, our stated assumptions, that the population relationship is in fact linear, the true errors are normally distributed, and the true errors have constant variance. And remember to check for these assumptions, there are two particular plots. The residual versus fitted plot checks for the first and third assumption, and the QQ plot checks for our second assumption, QQ plot for the residual specifically. Um, and then we can also look at how we do that test statistic. We'll specifically be looking at that t-test statistic and that p-value. Um, again, these are found within that, out, that regression output. So whenever we look at the p-value, we need to remember within the output, the p-value is always specifically for a two-sided test. So um, we must divide that by two if we're looking at a one-sided test. So if our alternative is one-sided, then we'll, whatever p-value is provided, we need to divide that by two. But if we are looking at a two-sided test, then you can just leave it alone. 
And also we talked about for R squared, um, if we don't have it within the output, we could also find it within our ANOVA output as well. Then we also talked a little bit about these particular um, differences between our prediction and our confidence intervals. We could say prediction intervals are always wider than confidence intervals and that the, both of these intervals are narrowest at our sample mean x bar. Um, and also looking back at our regression output, we could see what all of these, all, where all these variables are coming from. So we could say first that our standard deviation estimate is found um, within what is called the residual standard error within our output. So this S can be thought of as that average size of the residuals. If you want to learn more about that, you can look at page 200 in your lecture notes. But in terms of finding that estimate for a standard deviation, we could look to that standard error term within this output. And then this is this is just a nice slide looking at everything within this output that is relevant to us. So our y-intercept and, and slope estimates, um, our t-test statistic and our p-value, as well as that coefficient of determination, where all of these are within these outputs. All right. So that about does it for this particular lab. Um, so make sure, so just go back to those reminders for this week. Make sure that you're working on that lab wrap-up quiz um, that should be due by Friday. Um, there, because of the size of this lab, you don't have to worry about doing a lab ticket. We do have those provided for extra practice for you, but in terms of working on that lab wrap-up quiz, the questions will only be from the both um, lab 11 and 12s, both of their review by examples and ILPs. So you don't have to worry about that lab wrap-up quiz having any questions from the lab ticket. That'll just be for you for extra practice on this stuff. And remember, if you have any questions on anything that went on in this lab, you could always attend a one of the live stream virtual labs on Tuesdays or Wednesdays as well. And one of the instructors running those could easily answer your question. Once you've done that lab wrap up quiz, um, go ahead and finish up homework nine as well, as well looking at those um, pre-labs. Right. That about does it for me. Thank you guys for watching.